I'm Steve for This Look With Cars, and this is the brand new 2022 Toyota GR86. This is a rebadged version of the Subaru BRZ, and this is the first time that those of us in North America have gotten the Toyota GR86. For North America, the previous version was sold as a Scion FRS or the Subaru BRZ. And for those of you in Europe who did not get Scions, that was the brand name that Toyota was selling their really cheap vehicles under so that it didn't tarnish the Toyota brand. I always felt that the FRS or the BRZ didn't really belong with the rest of the Scion family, but Toyota was marketing the Scions to younger buyers and that's who they felt would be buying cars like this. The GR and GR86 stands for Gazoo Racing and that is Toyota's performance division. Toyota is now taking ownership of the GR86 and putting it under their performance brand. If you're looking for a review that goes over what pattern the mirrors make on the floor or how you receive text messages with the infotainment center, this is not the video for you. I don't work for a magazine and I'm not obligated to say anything. I'm going to cover what I think is important First, we're going to take a walk around the car. Then I'm going to put it on my lift and we'll find out how it works. And then we'll take it for a drive and I'll tell you what my impressions as a car guy are of the 2022 Toyota GR86. Let's take a look around it. I think the first thing we should do is take a look under the hood. To open the hood, we have a nice, easy to use hood release. What we're looking at here is a 230 horsepower, 184 foot pound of torque flat four it's nice to see there isn't any big plastic covers in here pretty much can see everything so first off in this corner we have a radiator cap and our coolant reservoir behind that is where all the fuses and relays are i feel it's kind of strange they stuck an ecu right here this is a naturally aspirated engine so it shouldn't be getting too hot but i'm not sure that's the best placement to put a computer Behind that is the battery, very easy to access there. It's not enclosed in a silly box or anything like that. Back here, it looks like an engineer went kind of crazy with the design of these pipes. Not sure that was really necessary. It's nice to see that the alternator and the compressor for the air conditioning is very easy to access. It looks like they stuffed the starter back here. Like that would take some time to get to. And the power steering pump is way down there. So hopefully you don't have any problems with your power steering because that does not look like fun to get to. Oil filter, however, is very easy to get to located right there, although it's upside down. So you might make a mess when you're trying to change it. You have your oil fill, washer fluid reservoir. And over here, look at this dinky master cylinder for the brakes. You have your brake reservoir above that. And then there's an even smaller master cylinder. That's the smallest one I've ever seen for the clutch right there. And of course, this is a hydraulic clutch. So you have a little reservoir that you'll have to monitor there. The service ports for the air conditioning is very easy to access. There's one right there and the other is over here. Looks like the air cleaner is very easy to change on this car. Looks like they put a really big expansion chamber there to try to get the noise correct on that intake. Overall, under the hood of the GR86, I'd give this a B+. I should mention that they made all the panels on the front of this car aluminum. They're trying to make up for some of the added weight of the engine and the safety features that they've had to add to this car. And Toyota says that this car is much more rigid than the previous version. Let's take a look inside. This car has a manual six-speed transmission. It's getting more unusual to find a manual transmission in a brand new car today. I like how big these toggles are. You can use these with gloves on. You can turn these with gloves on. These are actually buttons here too. I didn't realize that at first, but those are also buttons. I thought they were just labels. Back behind the shifter, we have the controls for the track mode and to turn both traction control and stability control off. When we put it in the track mode, it only turns the stability control off. It does not turn off traction control. Behind that is the controls for the heated seats, and way behind that is the cup holders. It's nice that they're out of the way because why are you using cup holders in a sports car? It's also a little back seat. 
This is a 2 plus 2. I believe that in Japan they register the cars based on the size of the engine and how many people it can carry. So maybe they put a back seat in this car so that it classifies for different registration or insurance rules in different countries. I'm not quite sure, but it's there and they should have just taken it out. They should have done what Nissan did, left the back seat out, given you a parcel tray back there. The trunk can be opened by pressing this button here in the trunk lid or by using the key fob. It's a pretty spacious trunk. Below this cover, comes with an air compressor, some tire goo. Looks like there's another computer over there. And then you have your tow hook. And over on this side, we have the lug nut wrench. Now let's put it up in the air and take a look underneath it. This car does have a square wheel and tire setup. It runs two 1540R18 Michelin Pilot Sports. It's nice to have a square setup if you're looking for a track day car. That way you can rotate your tires all around. You only need to carry one or two spares, which you can fit on any corner. So you don't have to carry as many tires and wheels around. These are 18 inch wheels and you can see the rotors are pretty small. They could have fitted a much bigger brake setup in there. But maybe for the weight of this car, this is all that's needed. If we start in the front of this car and look underneath, it's relatively flat under here. So they were thinking about aerodynamics and fuel economy when they made this car. You have a nice skid plate covering the engine. So if you're hitting any rumble strips, track debris, road debris, anything like that, it's not going to damage things. One thing I do like is it has front tow hooks on both sides. So tying the front of this car down on a trailer would be a breeze. The front suspension appears to be all stamped steel parts. It looks like the uprights are made of a cast iron or steel. They are not aluminum. The area in front of the front brakes is completely solid. There is no ventilation. There's no air ducting to the brakes. Looking up here, we can see the sway bar design. I think the front sway bar diameter is probably about adequate for the weight of this car. Moving back from that skid plate, we have a fiber material here. We saw a bunch of this being used on the Fords now. I assume they're doing it for weight and probably cost savings, but I'm not really sure how that would withstand all the moisture and salt that we have around here. Maybe it's fine. Then we have... These are plastic skid plates right here. This car does use a two-piece drive shaft. There's a carrier bearing there in the center. The rear half is quite a bit longer than the front half. And coming back in the car, we start to see some heat shielding. That's because the fuel tank is located here and here. This is a saddlebag fuel tank so that they can get the center of gravity down. It is made of plastic and they don't want the exhaust to melt it. And then these, these are more plastic shields. And we get a good look at the rear suspension. Looks like the majority of the rear suspension is made of stamped steel. There are no billet parts back here. Looks like this knuckle is a cast piece and it's not aluminum. Looks like it's made of steel. The rear of the car does have a tiny sway bar. Neither of these sway bars are adjustable. The only adjustment you have is to disconnect it and take the link out on one side. So you can either run it with or without the sway bar. There's no adjusting the strength of it. Power is driven to the rear wheels with what looks like adequate axles. It's fairly straight, so you're probably not going to have a whole lot of stress on these CV joints. This is, of course, independent rear suspension, so you have to rely on these little toe links right here to keep your wheels pointing in the correct direction. In the past, I've found that this is a very weak point on cars. So if you're going to take one of these to the track a lot, you will definitely want to keep an eye on that. If these end up being a problem on these cars, I'm sure that the aftermarket world will provide parts for it. Unfortunately, I don't see any tow hooks here in the rear. So to tie this down to your trailer, you're probably going to have to use the wheels or come over one of these lower control arms. There is a small little door above each exhaust that you can put your tow hook into but I would not recommend tying it down to a trailer using those. As you would expect, this car does not have true dual exhaust. It has a single pipe that comes into this muffler and then splits off to both sides. 
And on the back here, we have even smaller brake rotors and calipers. And I think that dust shield there makes the rotor look even smaller than it should. Let's put this back down and take it for a drive. Let's drive this around normally for a few minutes. The steering wheel is great. It's a great size, looks good. Very happy with that. Dashboard, similar. I already explained that I like how these toggles are very big. The knobs are easy to get to. You don't have to go through a touch screen to change anything about the car. The shifter on these cars has always been one of the best things about them. And this shifter is very good as well. Super, super confident about what gear you're in. Has a real short throw to it. I like this a lot. Let's pull onto the highway so we can hear what this thing sounds like. I think it sounds pretty good. It has good initial acceleration, but after that it kind of gives up. So this is not a fast car. This would be a car that's a lot of fun to drive around town though. really going through the gears there and I wasn't really getting any closer to, the, to this Toyota Sienna so this is not a fast car but nobody expects this to be a fast car where this car should shine is in the corners bit of a twisty road let's see how it handles this oh yeah this this car is very sure-footed no problems there Right now we're in the standard mode and this is the standard dashboard display, but if we change to track mode, the display changes completely and we get more information about the car. The stability control turned itself off, but we still have traction control. There's even a lap timer over here. Let's turn the traction control off completely. Now we have traction control and stability control off. One thing that's really nice is you don't have to be at a complete stop to change those. You can change those on the fly anytime you want to. That's somewhat unusual nowadays. We've seen how well this car accelerates. Now let's see how well it stops. Get up to 65 miles an hour, slam. Wow, the brakes are very impressive. I was not expecting that. There is no reason to have bigger brakes on this car. That is fantastic. All right, let's see how well this handles on this roundabout here. That was very neutral. It didn't seem to be pushing too much. Wasn't oversteering too much, but extremely controllable. This car is a really nice size. It's smaller than the Nissan Z, but bigger than a Miata. I feel this is just about the perfect size for a car. And for a car that is completely stock, this car has very good handling. And that's what these cars have always been known for. This second generation car certainly lives up to its predecessors. So would I get myself one of these? I would say yes. It has a Toyota badge on it. 
Although recently there has been some reports that maybe these aren't the track car that Toyota and Subaru are marketing them as. There's been some fires, there's been some engine problems. I don't think that I would be an early adopter for this car, but there's not a whole lot that I don't like about it. 